I am here to help you do even more unzipping <laughs> of your minds and of your hearts. Roxy Clay came out here and challenged your expectations. And I'm going to ask you to unzip and let your expectations fall out and push them aside altogether because they're holding you back. Expectations are those lists of things we build up that tell us how things should be. They keep us feeling safe. And they also often prevent us from being fully present in our lives and from living to our highest potential. So I'm going to tell you about my journey away from expectation, which also turned out to be a journey towards self-empowerment and hope, and then how it might apply to your relationships as well. I first learned about the power of letting go of expectation on my journey back to my natural family, my birth family. I'm adopted, and my adoption is a fairly standard post-World War II story in Great Britain. My natural parents lived next door to each other in a small town near the east coast of Scotland, and when they finished high school, they went to the west of Scotland, to Glasgow, a whopping 38 miles away. My father went to Glasgow University, my mother went to nursing school. And when she became pregnant, they decided they were going to get married. But they were going to wait and tell their families when they went home on Christmas break. So they expected to end that year by becoming a family. That was December 1966. What they got instead was a tearful breakup outside my father's garage. For my mother, that was followed by a stay at a mothering home, a daughter who left the hospital before she did, a bill for my foster care, and ultimately, my adoption. My father paid penance by working as a bricklayer for a year before he returned to university in Edinburgh. They never saw each other again. Whatever expectations they had were shattered. On top of that, they were told that they should be grateful privileged that they had a chance to redeem themselves and move on. This is all pretty standard stuff for that time and place. And I'm telling you this because I want to note that although my parents learned not to expect in the wake of our separation, this is not the productive kind of letting go. The kind of letting go that they learned is rooted in shame and in punishment. There isn't any hope in it. It's about shutting down. And what I would like us to do today is learn how to let go and open up. So fast forward 18 years from that tearful breakup in the garage. My adoptive father, my dad, had made it clear that he would totally understand if I wanted to go and find my natural family. And this is a lot easier in Scotland than it is here. They don't alter birth certificates. The adoptee has the rights to all the records. So I took myself off to the House of Records in Edinburgh. I got hold of my birth certificate. It had my birth name, my mother's name, her then address. It took me another 18 years to decide to search. The lead up to that would take another TED talk or two. <laughs> Mostly, something had shifted inside me. On a trip back in 2003, I walked past the house listed on the birth certificate, and I just couldn't let it go after that. I was led entirely by my gut. I kind of had to be. Adoptees are less than 5% of the population. Only a few of us search, and only a fraction of the people who search actually wind up being in reunion. There aren't enough of us for there to be a guidebook. And for me, this turned out to be a good thing. It did help that I had had my own child, my first child, um, in somewhat similar circumstances to my own birth. It also helped that I knew two other friends who were adoptees who were in reunion. They had gone into the reunion with a litany of expectations. One friend um, was in a relationship with her natural father that could best be termed as clandestine. The other friend's father drank himself into ICU the first time they met. Their relationships with all their natural families were fraught, to say the least. So I went in with an awareness of the risks. I looked clearly at the risks, and I decided to go ahead. I went in also trying to pare back to what I really hoped without the expectation. 
And what I hoped was to find my natural mother. I wanted to know where I came from. Yes, part of me did want the Oprah-style reunion. You know, the one where you go, and the whole gigantic, attractive, successful, natural family welcomes the adoptee on whom they've been waiting their whole lives. But I did not go expecting it. I paired back and back to what was driving the hope. I knew I had to hang on to that. I knew I had to be whole, and I had to expect nothing. When I felt ready to do that, I contacted Birthlink in Scotland. This is a nonprofit agency that helps adoptees and their families connect with each other. I put my name on the list for a searcher. That takes some months. So in the waiting time, I searched more deeply within myself. I asked myself all kinds of odd questions. What would I do if I found my mother and she was dying and needed my help? What would I make of it if I found her and she was alcoholic, obese, if she was destitute, a retired prostitute? And I realized that anything that would bother me deeply would do so because I already saw it as a weakness in myself. In other words, anything I might want her to change was really something I wanted to change in myself. I believe this is also called owning your own stuff. I also talked to my brother. He's also adopted, and he said, "Look, Heather, the only thing you really have to worry about is if you go to meet her and she comes to the door with her bags packed and goes, 'All right, darling, where are we going?' Because she thinks she's moving in with you. Anything else, you can just run away from. Stuart is often good." For a little bit of comedy with some truth embedded, and he was right. Either one of us could end the relationship at any moment, and isn't that the case with all our relationships? We behave as though, in our relationships, especially our significant ones, we behave as though we're operating with some kind of a relationship union, like a pipe fitters union that's going to uphold our expectation contract. But the truth is, relationships live in a right-to-work state. <laughs> Any party, and sometimes a third party like sudden death, can end the contract with no notice and no cause. And that is a scary truth to face. But as with any other truth, all the expectation in the world can't stop it. What I knew, what my natural parents and I had lived for nearly four decades before we came face to face, is that expectation doesn't guarantee you a thing. So I entered the relationship knowing the risks. I entered the relationship owning what I brought. I entered the relationship without that guidebook. And here's the good thing about there not being a guidebook: there aren't any articles about what a good reunion looks like, like the articles you read that imply that all the other married couples have more sex than you. <laughs> the skinny woman next door eats cherry pie for breakfast. The other guy's business makes more money than yours, and it's more fun to work there. All the things that build up our expectations, and they wreck our chances of honoring what's right in front of us. So when I entered the relationship in this way, what I found that I was able to really rest in and notice small moments, and to take joy there. I noticed, for instance, the grain of my mother's freckled hand wrapped around her mug of tea the first time we met. I got to experience her with the sureness, sureness of adulthood and the heart of a child. I didn't have my expectation checklist running through my head. <clears throat> That's what expectations do. They tend to run through our head, act like a third party in our relationship, constantly vying for our attention. And that feels okay when things match up. But even then, we've stepped away from the moment and the relationship to check in with them. 
And when things don't measure up, then we really go aside. We start talking to expectation, asking it for affirmation. He should have brought me flowers, shouldn't he? She should run those meetings on time. And our expectation list says, oh yes, honey, you are right. Get back in there and make them do it your way. So you keep asking and asking and getting grumpier and grumpier when things don't measure up. If you've asked a couple of times and you haven't gotten the response you wanted, you're probably not going to get it. And in that stepping away to measure up with expectation, you've missed the moment and the relationship as it unfolded. That might have offered a path forward. And even when the worst thing happens, when your expectations aren't met, and another path forward isn't on offer, you're then resting in the truth. And you can choose to move yourself forward from the truth of that relationship in that moment. Expectation does not stop painful stuff from happening. It just blames it on somebody else. What expectations do is pull us out of the moment. They hold us in an infinite loop of false possibility. So I challenge you today to free yourself from this loop of false possibility. Before you leave this building this afternoon, think of one relationship that has one unfulfilled expectation in it. Let the expectation go. Search yourself. Own your stuff. Commit to entering your next interaction in that relationship without the expectation, hanging on to some hope, and then just allowing yourself to fully rest in the reality of the moment. Whatever needs or wants you might have, it's possible that those can be met in some other way, but not by this person at this moment. Settle your heart to that, and then move yourself forward. I think you'll find that if you can be brave enough to rest in reality, human and flawed and possibly beautiful reality, it will take you places better than you've ever dared to expect. Thank you.